Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday Brief here on Joy News on Multi TV with me, Ni Akrofi Smatabe. Coming up in the headlines, some residents of Techiman in the Bongahafu region petitioned President John Dramani Mahama to urgently use his office to help clear the numerous refuse heaps in the area. The new Patriotic Party parliamentary candidate for Ahafo Ano North in the Ashanti region, Richard Akwaku Ediya, files a petition at the Kumase High Court challenging the declaration of the NDC candidate as winner of the 2012 parliamentary elections in that constituency. We'll also be joined in the studio by the convener for the Committee of Party Restructuring to tell us what the CPP needs to do to get back on its feet. And in wellness, we'll give you some tips on how to manage your dry skin and lips this hammer 10 season. That plus some information from across the uh, worlds of sports, business, international and showbiz all in a bit. Now to our first story. The new Patriotic Party's parliamentary candidate for Afano North in the Ashanti region Richard Ikuoko Ediya has filed a petition at the Kumase High Court challenging the declaration of the National Democratic Congress's candidate, Akwesi Eduse, as winner of the 2012 parliamentary elections in that constituency. This is the first legal challenge to the 2012 parliamentary elections to be mounted from the camp of the NPP. Last Saturday, the NPP's Communications Director Nanakumia hinted on Joy FM that the party would challenge the parliamentary results in 38 constituencies alongside the presidential election, which is already before the Supreme Court. Attorney in charge of the Ashanti region, William Kobi, confirmed in an interview with the Daily Graphic yesterday that his outfit has been served with a petition. The respondents in the case are the Electoral Commission and the Attorney General's Department, Kumasi Akuaku Ediya, through his lawyers, Owusu Bempa Law Chambers, is seeking a declaration that the irregularities practiced by the EC officials who were in charge of elections in the constituency affected the authenticity of the elections and therefore rendered the outcome now and void. The petitioner is also praying the courts for any other reliefs that it would deem fit. In a statement of claim, Akuaku Ediya said the elections were regulated by the Public Elections Regulations 2012 and the representation of the People's Law, 1992 PNDC Law 284. Besides, CI-75, among other things, set the rules by which the elections were to be conducted. According to the statement, to ensure free and fair elections, various pre-designed sheets were issued by the EC to gather data for verification and authentication of results from each polling station where elections were held. The returning officer in the constituency was to fill and sign the sheet, which would be countersigned by candidates contesting the election or their agents. The purpose of the sheet was principally to serve as accounting and auditing mechanism in order to ensure compliance with electoral rules and fairness to all the candidates, the statement said. It said the EC officials in the constituency in flagrant disregard for the rules, regulations and guidelines governing the election, either by deliberate conduct or circumstances that can best be explained by them, did not properly account for ballots issued to various polling stations, thus occasioning a serious irregularity. The statement further indicated that 835 ballots were not accounted for in 17 polling stations in the constituency because of the widespread irregularities. It said the elections were also held without biometric verification in three polling stations in contravention of electoral laws as contained in CI 75. The irregularities, according to the statement, affected the authenticity and credibility of the declared results which gave it to say 18,841 votes as against 18,418 by the petitioner. Well, the NPP will be going to court tomorrow for the first hearing of their case, but here, uh, before that, they've been holding a press conference here in Accra. Uh, my colleague, Eric Curtis Howard, is at that press conference, and he joins us on the line. Hello, good afternoon to you, Curtis. Good afternoon, Matt. Okay, so Curtis, what have the NPP been saying at their press conference? 
Yes, um, party chairman Jacobich Vilamse was the one who addressed the press conference. The first thing he said was that the fact that um, President Mahama has been inaugurated into office does not mean that um, the party's case in court is a uh, null and void. He's, he, he gave the, um, the, the, the incident that should a student go to the university with 45 results and a person comes out with a first class and the university detects that the student has used a 45 results to come to school, they can still withdraw their degree, their person's degree. So based on this premise, they, they believe that their case in court is still valid and the fact that they are still waiting now, the EC has already responded, they are waiting for the president. Um, lawyers to also respond for the first year in court to continue. The party also made a lot of a number of suggestions. They also said that um, 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 for over 400 votes that were cast in this particular election, uh, 400,000 votes that were cast in this particular, there was no validations for those results and um, uh, for those votes. And also 600,000 votes were due to over voting. And they said one in every vote. And that was cast must also be um, validated by the electoral commission. And 12% of the vote cast were also invalid. Those are some of the um, suggestions that were made at this particular court hearing. Um, Party chairman Jacobici Lamse said, um, "What they are going to do now is that the EC acts that they should give um, names of specific polling centres that um, that they detected these anomalies." Mm -hmm. And um, what he said was that they are still collating their evidence, and once they, the matter arrives in court, once the case is called in court, and once they appear in court, they will make all this, um, they make all this case known to the judge for proceedings to start. Mm. Okay, but Curtis, did they also talk about the parliamentary seats they intend to contest? Because, yes. for instance, we know the Ahafwa North, North uh, candidate has already filed his petition in court. Yes, and party chairman, what he said was that according to the constitution. Um, you can, um, a member of parliament can, you can contest a parliamentary result after it has been gazetted, 21 days after it has, it has been gazetted by the electoral commission. Okay. So he said that he knows of 30 cases, there are 30 cases, parliamentary cases that have also been sent to court, that um, the party will also be challenging, party um, candidates that stood for the election will be challenging. So there are cases in court, so once the case are also called in court, and um, once they start with the presidential case, they're also hoping that the presidential case, the uh, parliamentary case will be held at a different court for the process to continue. So right. with, with the parliamentary, is it that the various individuals involved are the ones then going to file the, the petition for those cases, or still it will be from the party's uh, uh, quarters? Um, it's going to be it's from two parties, the two, the two parties, both the, part, the parties quarters and the individuals involved. Um, okay. They are the ones that will be um, pursuing the, the case in court. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Curtis. Eric Curtis Howard is my colleague. He is attending the NPP's press conference here in Accra, where they have been updating the media about their preparation for court tomorrow. And they say they have uh, evidence that over six, there are about 600 uh, of the election res results were due to overvoting and 400 uh, results were not validated. Uh, but uh, still in relation to that, the Electoral Commission has denied claims that the presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party in the December uh, 2012 elections, Nana Dudankwe Kufuado, won that election. In its defense to a petition challenging the declaration of John Dramani Mahama as the winner of the 2012 December elections, the EC maintained that the petition is without merit and accordingly prayed the Supreme Court to dismiss it. In a statement of defense filed on behalf of the EC by Lynn's Kwashi Aiden and Co. at 3.15 p.m. on January 7, 2013, a few hours after the Chief Justice, Justice Georgina Theodora Wood, had sworn in John Mahama as president of Ghana, the EC denied the claims by the petitioners that it deliberately denied Nana Ekufuado victory. Responding to the petitioner's claim for the deduction of 1,342,845 votes from the total valid votes cast and the subsequent claim that those deductions were in favor of Nana Ekufuado, the statement urged the Supreme Court to reject the proposed deductions since neither the formula nor the justification for them has been presented by the petitioners, nor has any indication been given by the petitioners as to how the figures were arrived at. On allegations that the votes earned by Nana Ekufuado were unlawfully reduced, whilst votes for President Mahama were illegally padded with the sole purpose of procuring 
ensuring victory for President Mahama. The statement replied by praying the court to order the petitioners to provide particulars of the polling stations in which the alleged reduction and padding took place. It stated that the EC declined to hold the declaration of results on December 9, 2012, because the MPP hierarchy, which had prayed it to halt the declaration in the presence of members of the National Peace Council, had been provided with either inaccurate or wrong data by its polling agents. The statement prayed the Supreme Court to reject the petitioner's allegations since they were based on wrong and inaccurate information. It, however, conceded that the figure of 14,158,890 registered voters stated in the Declaration of Results was an error occasioned by picking the wrong figure. The number of registered voters which should have been picked was 14,031,793, which was duly posted on the EC's website. In this context, it is important to emphasize that this error had no bearing whatsoever on the total votes cast in the election and consequently the valid votes obtained by each candidate. The error would only affect the voter turnout percentage and change it from 79.43% to 80.15%, it explained. In the petitioner's claim of late submission of the voters register to the MPP, it denied that allegation and said the MPP and the NDC, being the two parties with candidates in all constituencies in Ghana, were the first to receive the formal voters register DC as of November 21, 2012, one week after the Interparty Advisory Committee IPAC meeting held on November 14, 2012. The statement denied the petitioner's claims that the total number of registered voters in the presidential election exceeded that of registered voters for the parliamentary election by 127,210 and held that the same register had been used for both the presidential and the parliamentary elections. It said in a mischievous attempt to buttress baseless accusations made to the media, the petitioners deliberately used an erroneous figure of 14,158,880 instead of 10,995,262 as the total number of votes cast in favor of the contesting presidential candidates among others. The statement, accordingly, prayed the Supreme Court to dismiss the petitioner's allegations since they were without merit. Here on the Joy News Channel on Multi TV with me, Niakro Fis Matabe. Uh, still ahead in the bulletin, we'll be, we will be talking to the CPP, which has uh, set up a committee for party reorganization. We'll get into details to find out exactly what that committee is supposed to be doing. And then also we'll touch base uh, with the presidential transition team and also find out an update on their... Welcome back. Now, the national organizer of the Convention People's Party, Abu Fogo, says the party now needs more committed members to move forward. According to him, the party's abysmal performance in the just-ended elections was because the party is filled with members who are not committed to the party's vision and progress. Speaking to Joe News, the national organizer cited financial commitment as one of the major factors. Most of our people haven't been that committed. And uh, the issue of our dues, which makes one feel he or she is a partner of the party and has some responsibility and has a stake in the party, is to let people commit themselves financially to the party. So we're thinking about making it compulsory that if you really want to be a member from the grassroots to the top, then you should be committed by giving us the opportunity to be taking your dues. Though he did not agree with the proposal by Samia Nkrumah that the party needs a total overhaul, he entreated party supporters to stop the blame game and commit themselves to the party. If uh, she says overhaul, overhaul with some of us, our understanding is that the party indeed needs committed people, not just people being in there as members. And when it comes to the time that you need to see the numbers, you don't find the numbers. 
you know. So the overhauling is to see to it that, yes, the people who are there know why they are there, get involved actively by contributing in many ways to get to the party to where it's supposed to be. We have the best of uh, structures, but it's just that this time round it didn't work, but that doesn't mean that that is the end. 8th of January is Positive Action Day on the CBP calendar and the national organizer used the day to call on the nation to discard tribalism. Okay, so now we've been joined in the studio by Kweku Datsi, who is the convener for the Committee for Party Reorganization of the CPP. Good afternoon to you, Kweku, and thanks for joining us. Yes, good afternoon. Okay, so um, first of all, let's, uh, for those who probably do not know this uh, committee very well, tell us exactly what your terms of reference will be. Um, precisely, in the light of the catastrophic performance of the CPP, in the just ended December 2012 elections, um, some parliamentary candidates, the youth, some of the youth, um, central committee members, some of them, and also CP UK representatives formed a coalition, or let me say a committee. And a committee actually brainstormed on two occasions, one on December 15th and the other on December 22nd. Mm -hmm. And we did a review and analysis of our electoral performances and realize that the problem confronting the party is so enormous. And therefore, we need one, an effective political program, which will have four main components, finance, communication, research, and um, uh, also um, grassroots mobilization. And um, these will be the major focus of the committee. And um, there are a lot of impediments that um, actually have affected the party lack of planning, lack of coordination, lack of fundraising mechanisms, um, lack of ideological training, which is very important looking at the two main political parties that we have. The only way to defeat them is to build individuals who are really committed to the party and true ideological training will be the solution. And so these impediments will be resolved if you have an effective political program. What we've had in the past is uh, an idea of national leadership an idea of the flag bearer, uh, a report by a research committee, a report by this committee. We don't have any comprehensive political program that is born out of ideology. Mm -hmm. And when I mean ideology, I'm referring to a scientific way of organizing to take over power in this country. And that is precisely what a committee is about to do. Mm. So is it something that is the committee set up for the long run, or is it just so that you could strategize, put the party back on track, and then that's it? Precisely. Um, the traditional organs of the party remain, the Youth League, the Women's League, um, the Research Committee, all these committees will exist all right. But a committee in its work will sh reshape these committees, will also assist in building grassroots members, embark on membership drive, develop initiatives in terms of financing where people could use different technological means to donate funds for the party so that uh, both within the short term, medium and long term, the party can benefit. Mm. The Committee for Party Reorganization, let me say, um, was born out of pain um, among some of the parliamentary candidates, feeling that they have a lot of experience that they can bring on board to the party. And therefore, they need a platform. And the platform that was created was a Committee for Party Reorganization. Mm. You said that you identified some problems, sure. which also, of course, gave birth to this uh, committee being formed. What were the exact problems that you identified? Um, first is the general weakness of the party from the polling station to the highest decision making. Um, as you are well aware, the result that came, we had zero in some of the polling stations, which means that we have polling station executives. Um, I work closely with the, um, some of the parliamentary candidates in the, in the election and um, we, we knew very well that in some of the polling stations we will get zero because the party didn't work hard to organize polling station executives. That is number one. We also have, in terms of lack of planning, uh, we, we, we lack coordination in terms of um, um, the activities before the election. The election is just one single event, mm -hmm. but there's a whole process that involves in terms of um, filing of parliamentary candidates, uh, preparing your parliamentary candidate, training of polling agent. All of them, lack, in terms of lack of planning, affected these things. And um, there's also coordination that is missing in terms of our campaign. And we think that another impediment is fundraising. And I think the major blow to the party, 
for the past few decades. How do we raise funds independently? Mm -hmm. And many a times it affected our members uh, leaving the party to join the mainstream political parties because they felt like, oh, the party is not moving because of fundraising. Therefore, when they move here, they can get certain funds. And therefore, we need an independent mode of fund fundraising, which will help the party. Mm -hmm. Now, lack of training is also one of the impediments. Okay. And we can't ignore that. Okay. Uh, you, you, you issued a resolution after the committee met. Uh, one important thing you raised was that you're conscious of the toll that disloyalty in discipline and open betrayal has taken on the party's fortunes uh, throughout history. Sure. Uh, do you think probably this also accounted for your lone rager in parliament, Sami Nkrumah, who is the party's chair, losing her seat in the just ended elections? Um, indirectly, indirectly. Now, she was alone in parliament. Of course, trying to build that independence is very difficult, especially one because she's alone to your party is weak. So what do you have to do? The first thing is to target your parliamentary seat. Get more seats in parliament rather than spending your money on, uh, on, on huge presidential campaign where you know that the structures are not there. So you target seats, seats which are traditional CP holds so that you can get this seat back again so that it can strengthen her work in parliament. Mm. So as a result of this difficulty, she suffered in the election. But the election itself is a different matter in terms of what took place there that made her to lose that seat. Um, there's a lot of disloyalty in the CPP and indiscipline. Uh, let me say... Could that also have affected uh, Dr. Sakara? Of course. Of course. Because we have a problem um, in terms of um, our members being used by other political parties. Um, how do we recruit a member? Who becomes a member is important. And therefore, if you don't have these two questions resolved, you have an, a member who can easily switch to the mainstream parties without you not knowing and be working for them against your interest. So our mode of recruitment needs to change. We need to build ideological committed members who really affirm to Nkrumah's ideas and for which for years they will remain members of the party. How, do, how exactly do you intend to do that? And also to ensure that if someone calls himself or herself as a CPP member, it's not just by word of mouth, just the person saying it, but really and truly, the person belongs to the party in every sense. First, the person should be committed to paying dues. Uh, the person should be able to take part in party work, whatever he finds himself at the polling station, at the electoral area, at the constituency, at the regional, at the highest level. The person should be able to find a role to play in the party. Two, the person should be self-reliant in terms of working within the structure and not always trying to depend on the two main parties. I think that the characters of a true member of a party is clear. And we believe that um, the only way is when we start a training, when we commit people to study. Of course, Kwame Nkrumah left what, what, us. Sorry to talk about what will go into the training? Um, one, one, training one, one is conscientizing people to understand the true history of this country. Okay. Um, two, for them to understand the philosophy of the party, what we really stand for in terms of how to make sure that the, the community owns production and how to ensure that the production that um, takes place is well distributed amongst the people. Um, what is the relationship between the resources and individuals? These things take in different form in terms of um, whether a person is literate or illiterate. There are several modes that you can use to train people to understand these things for them to become committed members. Otherwise, they will be deceived by, by money, they can easily be deceived by, by lies or, or concocted story as we've been seeing in the past by the two main parties. So we need to build these members through these processes and I think that that will help a lot. Mm. So um, how about the money issue, the buying, quote unquote, of members? How exactly do you intend to stop that? Because it will be difficult, I, don't, I, I think personally that it will be difficult to stop or to monitor everybody and know who is taking money from where at what time. First, we need to put up an effective accountability system. If we know how much the party is raising, in terms of donation, in terms of um, um, dues payment, it will really help a lot. That's the first thing. And then second thing also, commit people to take certain costs. And their actions will reflect whether they are truly for you or for you. Because of course, if you go and take money from these two main parties, your actions will tell. Okay. Yes. Uh, just hold on for me a second. We, we have been joined on the line uh, by the spokesperson for 
the transition team, James Ajeni Mboating. Uh, good afternoon to you, sir, and thank you for joining us on the Midday Brief. Thank you very much, Amin. Okay. Uh, first of all, I just want to find out from you, is the, uh, is the team still working? Uh, and exactly what are you still doing at this time if you're still working? Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. You notice that under the Presidential Transition Act 2012 at 845, there are a number of tasks that the transition team must carry out. Mm -hmm. It includes not only the inauguration of His Excellency, um, the Vice President and the President, but also the wrapping up and handing over of the government machinery mm -hmm. to the new administration, yep. as well as the collation and handing over of both the assets and liabilities of the executive of the existing administration to the new administration, plus any other task that may be relevant to the discharge of a work of a transition team. It appears that at this point, what has effectively been wrapped up is that of the inauguration, with the inauguration of the Vice President and the President last Monday. But there still remain other issues, issues such as what must be done uh, perhaps with respect to uh, seeing of public officers, Article 31 of his holders, who have effectively served their nation and they are on their way out. Those are matters that I still believe ought to be wrapped up and effectively so by the transition team. Mm. And we know that the, the uh, ministers and other government appointees were supposed to hand over, and the, indeed they have done that per the re uh, requirements of the Transitional Act. But uh, the president also has directed them to go back in uh, to stand in as caretakers of their various ministries, and that indeed is uh, raising a few eyebrows. Um, why exactly are they back at their ministries as in caretaker positions? Isn't it supposed to be the chief uh, directors of these ministries who are supposed I'm to take sure, over? I'm not sure that the, the, um, the, the announcement by His Excellency the President is really uh, is raising any eyebrows. Indeed, if it is, it may just mean that perhaps because people may not be very familiar with the provisions of the Presidential Transition Act. Indeed, the Act uh, does contemplate a situation where just up immediately, um, the days immediately after the swearing in, clearly you would have no ministers, no deputy uh, ministers. So what do you do with the government business? What do you do with the ministries? You don't want the um, government business to be in a limbo. So the Act explicitly provides that His Excellency the President can nominate persons to be in charge of these ministries, uh, at least in the meantime. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what was done uh, yesterday's announcement. So if there's anybody who is having concern about it, they ought not be concerned because it is explicitly provided for uh, in our laws per uh, new presidential transition act and be that as it may um even when we did not have the presidential transition act in 2008 that arrangement was made to ensure that government business continued ahead of the nomination of um, ministers and their appearance before the parliamentary appointment committee and subsequent confirmation by by parliament hmm. yeah Okay, uh, you, or you, you did make, make uh, reference to the fact that at least you finished with the swearing-in of the president and the vice, but a few other things are left to be taken care of. Uh, what exactly, if you can tell us, are left for the team to... Uh, what well, tasks yeah, are left for the you? Law, uh, the law also requires that those who are duly qualified and perhaps are owed any benefit by the state as a result of... Uh, positions which were entrusted to them under Article 71 be effectively seen off as the law requires. I'm not sure that that matter has been resolved. Clearly, it means that the transition team will have to continue to function and discharge that obligation placed on it by the Presidential Transition Act. Mm. Okay. So I presume, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> so I presume those are uh, some of the things that are left for the committee to do. But how soon do you intend to wrap up 
work um, as far as these issues and others that you are left with pending? I think that his, both His Excellency the President and the Vice President, as well as members of the transition team themselves, uh, want to quickly wrap up the work. But it's not also just about speed, it's also about effectively and competently dealing um, with the uh, issue. So it's uh, uh, a fine rope that must be walked, um, wrapping up speedily and also effectively, and putting a closure to all the other issues that must be closed before the transition team can run. Mm. And, and finally, has the team any idea when the president will start uh, naming or nominating ministers to uh, fill in the positions at the various ministries? The that's not part of the mandate of the presidential transition team. The, I mean, appointment is, is not one of the those things that the presidential transition team um, has jurisdiction over or must worry said about. Okay. The matter totally reserved for His Excellency the President. And I think clearly from yesterday, President Bahama has indicated that he started with his appointment and you've had a couple of names rolled out from yesterday. Mm. So let me give matters to President Bahama. Okay. Well, we'll say a big thank you to you, uh, Mr. James Ejeni Mboating. He is the spokesperson for the transition team. Um, Sorry, he was bringing us up today. He tells us that there are quite a few other uh, issues that the, the team is tasked with that they have to wrap up with. And it's not just about wrapping up with speed, but it's also about ensuring that their work is effectively and efficiently done. But uh, in the studio, I still have with me Kwekudatsi, who is the convener for the Committee for Party Reorganization of the CPP. And... Um, let me come to you, Kweku. Um, one main concern or issue that has come up quite often is about the fact that the CPP hasn't got too many young people in there. Is that also one thing that your uh, committee is looking out for? I mean, ensuring that as part of what you're doing, the reorganizing the party, you get more young people like yourselves on board? Yeah, certainly. Um, for quite some time now, the youth, some of the young people have involved themselves in party organization, but um, it's been gradual in terms of they taking the front role. But uh, recently, the national chairperson and leader, Honorable Samia Nkroma, announced that um, she will be willing to involve the youth in active front role, and therefore, for instance, the central committee will need to be restructured to involve young people with experience in terms of um, different disciplines to reshape the party's organization. And so we are so glad that um, she made that pronouncement. And one of the things that the committee uh, intends to do in terms of mobilizing young people to take part in party organization has to do with training. And I think that um, the country is um, made up of a young, young, lot of young people, but how do you reach out to them through social media network, through interaction, um, lots of groups that I made in talking about Pan-Africanism, talking about the need for Ghana to be self-reliant and um, uh, take away uh, in terms of World Bank, IMF influence in reshaping our economy. And therefore, these young people who make these brilliant contributions need to be brought into the party, given a specific task so that um, it helps propel the party towards power. And I think that we've started that, and uh, just that we've not read the maturity period. Hmm. But um, I'm one of them, there are several of them, Ernest Okufi Yeboa, Ernest Afram, Cornelius Ajete, several young people are uh, working hard, but just that we need a lot of young people. So I'll use the platform to appeal to young people who will be willing to um, contribute their time, their energy in rebuilding the CPP to make it Kwame Kwame's heritage that was over 1966. Mm. So, is the committee working with any timelines? Uh, are you supposed to have a specific time within which to achieve result X, Y, or Z? Yes. Um, as clearly stated in our resolution, we need first an effective political program. It is within this political program that we have timelines. We have about three months what we need to do, um, 12 months what needs to happen, two years what needs to happen. And the political program will definitely have components that, for instance, indicators to um, tell us which direction we are going so clearly um, the program is still under development because we're still involving some of our parliamentary candidates to bring their proposals um, we are also tapping the experience of 
our, our council of elders, those who saw how the um, uh, the party was was built during the 50s and 60s. Um, today is positive action day. That was yesterday, but today mm -hmm. we marked it with the press conference. And um, 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 62 years ago, Nkrumah used one weapon, which is positive action. And clearly, it is significant today. And these are tools that we believe strongly the party can adopt to freely express its position on matters that affect the people of this country. And in that line, it will draw a lot of people on board. It will encourage people to pay dues, contribute any amount of money. It will encourage people to walk, to paste posters. It will encourage a lot of people because you are, you are expressing the needs of people. Mm. The mining situation, <coughs> the timber exploitation, the exploitation going on in the workers, all will be part of the thinking that will lead to the development of that political program. And speaking of drawing people, in my last question to you, are you do you still have the support and do you have on board um, other big party wigs like uh, Professor Edmond Daly, do you still have their support? Yes. Are they still with yes, the CPP? Yes, Professor Edmond Daly is still a member of the CPP. He is a member of the Council of Elders. He was formerly um, a, a national, cha mm. national chairman. He also served on the National Committee and he has been contributing for the um, full look of the party. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very big thank you to you, Kweku Dazi. Thank you very uh, much. Kweku Dazi is the convener for the Committee for Party Reorganization of the Convention People's Party, CPP. And he's been telling us what they are about, uh, trying to reorganize the CPP, rejuvenate it, and make it the party that Nkrumah established, and make sure that it lives up to the ideals Nkrumah intended for it to live up to. This is the midday brief here on Joy News on Multi TV. We are back in 40 seconds. Thank you. News Generation Sundays, Multi TV for Kids Channel. 3.30 p.m. Join News Channel, 4 p.m. You're welcome back. Now let's, take, let's do some more stories. And some residents of Tichiman in the Bongahafu region have petitioned the president, John Domani Mahama, to urgently use his office to help clear the numerous refuse, refuse heaps in the area. According to them, even though the Tichiman Municipal Assembly has been doing its best to rid the uh, area of the mountains of refuse, external assistance to get it done is needed. The residents were speaking to our Bongahafu regional correspondent, Kafui Ajoma, at Tichiman. Man is one of the major cities in the Brong Ahafo region and perhaps the busiest. Due to its brisk business activities, the population is always increasing. Managing waste has become a problem due to the increasing number of people creating sanitation and waste management problems for authority. Heaps of waste products in the various suburbs of Techiman is also a direct result of its large population. Attempts by the residents in the area to get the Techiman Municipal Assembly to clear the refuse heaps have yielded little results. Speaking to Joy News, residents appealed to the president to use his high office to order the clearing of the mountains of refuse. They also appealed to the appropriate authorities, including President Mahama, to help curb the high incidence of communicable diseases in the areas. They say 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 
na juma a oye nti na yetu abanu manu but bola no wasi sabi akabi e ma dwene ko an de e se le dia ko janu manu obeti na se ni de onfo so no nto ajuma no so no nsi sabi aka ni na na kronu ni yefefefe ma nesta kafui ajomas report for joy news well, the young man said that a uh, president has started collecting the refuse. I wonder if he means the president or the district assembly. But let's come down to Accra from Tichima. And the per, uh, process to demolish a weak five-story building at Amrahia in the Adenta municipality has begun. Roofing sheets and other reusable materials are being salvaged from the structure before the demolition. The assembly and family have also decided to use a demolition wrecking ball instead of explosives. According to sources at the Adenta Municipal Assembly, the choice of using explosives was rescinded as its impact on other structures in the area was going to be very serious. After consultations with authorities at the National Disaster Management Organization, the owner of the building suggested the use of a demolition wrecking ball since its effects will be minimal. The assembly says the owner of the building was going to foot the bills for the demolition. In a telephone conversation with Joy News, the owner of the building, Mr. Ampoma, said, the demolition was underway as the roofings of the building had been removed and this was confirmed on our arrival at the site. The structure used to be a twin structure but the other one collapsed mid last year after which the owner was notified to stop construction at the site. This however did not happen and the municipal assembly had to take the necessary precaution to stop construction which was still ongoing as of 8th November last year. Makeshift pillars were constructed to hold the remaining building, but as you can see, it wasn't the best. It is the hope of the assembly that the building will be demolished as soon as possible. Well, we hope they do that pronto. Now, imagine getting 17 Ghana cities as your monthly salary when your expected salary ranges between 1,400 and 2,500 for 15 consecutive months. Well, that is the plight of pharmacists in Ghana. The concerned pharmacist group backed by members of the Young Pharmacist Association will lay down their tools by 31st of this month if government persists on ignoring their plight. It has been back and forth for 15 consecutive months between the Government and Hospital Pharmacists Association, GOSPA, the Fair Wages and Salary Commission, the Labor Commission and Government on the salary discrepancies among health and other government workers. After several strike actions to register their displeasure, the issue has gotten to the boiling point. I think personally the whole setup of Fair Wages and Salary Commission has not been fair towards the profession called pharmacists. Uh, there should be proper investigations into every a job evaluation that was done and the outcome looked carefully by third parties as a conspiracy in the Ministry of Health or somewhere to make pharmacy worse off in the Ministry of Health. Maybe they want us to leave the Ministry of Health and come and do our jobs. The group is worried that the much spoken about single spine salary structure is reducing their monthly salary instead of increasing it and are calling on government to correct these anomalies. According to controller, the reasons why we were getting zeros and 280 and 17 was because we reverted back to the HSS after being initially put on the single spine. Um, according to them, the machine, um, they have scrapped the HSS from the system. Most pharmacies are of the view that the various institutions supposed to address discrepancies in the salary structure are not working properly. President of the Government and Hospital Pharmacists Association, GOSPA, Stephen Kokwe, is worried the situation might get out of hand if government does not act fast. When you get to a situation like this and the pharmacists become very frustrated, that is not good for the provision of pharmaceutical services in the entire country. That means that the provision of uh, medical care to our clients can be compromised. Pharmacy's role in making sure that the patient gets his medication and get well cannot be overemphasized. In a telephone interview with the chairman of the Fair Wages and Salary Commission, Graham Smith, 
He assured that the commission is working towards addressing the anomaly. However, some pharmacists are still of the view that the solution is for President Mahama to ensure that state institutions work. Morale now is very low because from what we went to meet at the controller and accountant general, uh, most of our colleagues, apart from the pharmacists, that's the entry point. All the others are basically worse off So, in terms of salaries. When people cry too much, people must then go and find out why are they crying? Why is pharmacy crying? Do they have a case? Why are them? And, and, when, and, 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 when, and when that is solved, they will no, for all you know, it's not that the of state is working. Maybe the person in charge has his own personal interest. And for that matter, he's using the background, the cover, the power of the institution of state to do whatever he or she wants to do. So in that aspect, yeah, that's what I would like to advise President Ma. We should find a team to find out what actually is happening with the pharmacists in the healthcare delivery system. The last time pharmacists went on strike, the ordinary Ghanaian who needed to purchase prescribed medication for their various ailments were the sufferers. That's on MC. Join News. Okay, so uh, Jennifer Jane Asante is in the house. She has some wellness tips and some news from across the globe, right? Yes, I do. I also have sports and showbiz. Oh, okay. And showbiz, I guess some nominations are out. Oh, yes. The it's best. the best and the worst. Okay. We'll be getting to that in okay, a bit. Okay, I, I won't steal the thunder. But for so. now, mm. we'll be talking about wellness. Now, you're a male presenter, mm -hmm. so maybe you should pay attention to this because oh, we're looking really? at uh, dried lips. Okay. And all the other oh, things is, that we have to suffer which through. Which is more with like my middle town. name, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, mind me. Just over to you. Okay, then. So the Hamatan is a period of low humidity with very little atmospheric moisture as compared to the other seasons of the year. Now, as a result, the weather appears to be harsh to our skin and also to our lips. The good news is we can still manage to keep our skin and lips smooth and moisturized. You only need to add. A few things here and there. If you follow our tips on caring for skin during the Hamatan season, you should be able to find your way. Since the weather is cold and dry, the fall is to constantly keep the skin fresh and moisturized as well as avoid cracked lips. Skin experts say adding a few drops of body oil or antiseptic to bath and water can help retain moisture on the skin after bath. During the season, skin experts advise against excessive scrubbing of the body when taking a shower. Just mopping the body will suffice. And you don't have to completely dry your body after shower. Dermatologist comments the use of emoline creams or Vaseline to prevent skin dryness and cracking of the lips. The skin is dry, mm -hmm. very dry like that. That's why in dermatology we talk of emoline creams. Mm -hmm. Creams that will keep the skin moist, that will trap the, the water on the skin. Mm -hmm. And so oils are useful, Vaseline, in fact one of the simplest that which people don't like Ordinary Vaseline or paraffin, those who can afford it can go and buy E45. Mm -hmm. and they can go and buy things like aqueous cream, mm -hmm. put a little bit of olive oil on it mm -hmm. so that they protect the skin from drying. And those who have dry, just some Vaseline. We also cannot underestimate the damaging effects the cold, dry hamatan coupled with hot weather can have on the skin sunscreen with protection factor of about 25 to 30 percent especially for people who stay under the sun for long hours don't forget to carry a hand cream as you go about your daily business so if you do not have a hand cream it is time to invest in one to restore skin hydration both the young and old are advised to drink lots of water adopt healthy eating lifestyle and as much as possible reduce sugar intake a lot of fruit juices sip them gently so that at least you have a lot of fluid in your system try to trap the water on the skin by using these emollients okay. and these oils to put not to allow the water to evaporate more from the skin. Mm -hmm. So we are putting it inside by drinking, and we are also preventing 
in the, the matter from taking away those. And that makes us, sometimes you look as if you are an old man. And in fact, the, the problem of aging is actually that as we grow, we lose a lot of water from the cells. And that is why we have this wrinkling and so forth, and take a lot of vegetables. Some who can afford can get some vitamin C, ascorbic acid is useful. We take a gram a day so that to protect your, <laughs> your lips too. Once you take control of your skin and lips, the harsh hamatan can never take you hostage. So there you have it, a few tips on how to keep yourself looking good during this Hamatan season. Now in today's international brief, we're taking a look at the inauguration of President Hugo Chavez, which has been postponed. And there are at least seven people dead and nine wounded after the latest tribal violence in southeastern Tana Delta region. All right, so now we're going to talk about a very important person, that is Emmanuel Adebayo, who has accepted to participate in the African Cup of Nations tournament only after he has been persuaded by President Fiore Nyasingbe against his decision. And we have some other stories in our sports brief too. African champion Zambia's coach Heavy Renaud has finally announced his 23 bullets that will be taxed with the Nations Cup title defense in South Africa. Renard left out Chintu Kampamba, injured while in camp, Sulelani Firi and Shadrek Malambo on the list submitted to the Confederation of African Football Cup on Tuesday, January 8. Zambia has so far enjoyed a poor form in their international friendly games and is winless in four. The Chipolopolo lost 1-0 to neighbors Tanzania, lost 2-0 to Angola, 2-1 to Saudi Arabia and drew goalless with Morocco on Tuesday. Lance Armstrong will break his silence about his lifetime ban from cycling and the doping charges made against him in a televised interview with Oprah Winfrey next week. The television producer has announced the interview to be broadcast on the Oprah Winfrey Network on January 17 will be the first the U.S. cyclist has conducted since receiving his ban and being stripped of his seven Tour de France titles. Armstrong will address the alleged doping scandal, years of accusations of cheating and charges of lying about the use of performance-enhancing drugs throughout his storage cycling career, the network said in a statement on Tuesday. Okay, so that takes care of my being here on the Midday Brief. I'm going to hand you back to Smart. You have more news, don't you? I do. All I right. certainly do. Um, we are talking about one of the PIs, uh, <laughs> the price index. Of, uh, so let's cross over now and speak to my colleague, Imana Lante, who joins us on the phone lines to tell us what uh, the consumer price index was for last month. Uh, hello, good afternoon to uh, you, Imano. Good afternoon, Smart. Okay, so which of the PIs, I think we are talking about the consumer price index, right? That's a CPI. Yes. yes. Okay, so what's the, what are they telling us about the CPI? Where does it stand now? Well, for the year-on-year -year CPI inflation, as uh, uh, measured by the CPI, stood at 8.8 percent, a decline uh, from the 9.3 percent recorded in November 2012. Um, this 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 just means that it means uh, even though there were price increases in this uh, year, this uh, November and uh, December, it, as compared to last year, November and December, it means the price has d reduced a bit. Um, what consumers used to um, buy, which was increased from probably 100, let's say 100,000 100, uh, for now, it w was increased to 150. But it wasn't as the price increased in 2011, which was from uh, 100,000 to 200,000. So that is the, what it really means now. Mm. So, but that's the year on year um, CPI inflation you've given us. Um, yeah. Did they give the one for the month of uh, December? Okay, the monthly change rate for December 2012 was 0.7%. Um, uh, this, this was as a result of a, 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 the monthly rate recorded in November, uh, as against the monthly rate uh, recorded in November, 0.5%. Mm, okay, uh, we'll leave it there, uh, Imano. Thank you so much for the update. Uh, the CPI for last month, he says, is 0.7%.
rate and the year-on-year -year, uh, CPI inflation is 8.8%. Uh, we'll get you more details on this and more at 8 o'clock uh, when we come on your way again with our primetime news. In the meantime, uh, here are some of the headlines we've been looking at. Uh, some residents of Tichiman in the Bongahafu region have petitioned President John Domani Mahama to urgently use his office to help clear the numerous refuse heaps in the area. The new Patriotic Party's parliamentary candidate for Ahafano North in the Ashanti region, Richard Ekuoko Edia, has filed a petition at the Kumase High Court challenging the declaration of the NDC's candidate as winner of the 2012 parliamentary elections in that constituency. And we also brought you an update on the CPP's Committee for Party Restructuring, which they hope is going to get the party back on its feet. And we also did some wellness, some international sports and showbiz briefs. Uh, that's it for the midday brief. My name is Nia Kofi Smatabe. Many thanks for joining us. We're back again at 8 with more stories.